Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. Sorry for the delay on my end making new videos. I've been traveling a little bit, uh, just like back home for the week, and uh, just had a ton of errands. My ceiling is leaky, a bunch of water got all over my tech, and uh, I almost flipped a shit. So yeah, stupid delays, stuff like that. Anyways, let's go ahead and get into this video. All right, so today we're gonna be talking about SQL databases. So just before I really get into things, as a quick 30 second cautionary rant, please skip over this if you don't care. I am going to make a lot of generalizations about both MySQL and Postgres in this video, and the truth is these are technologies that are open source, they're constantly changing, and pretty much anything I say about them is pretty much falsifiable. Like, objectively, even though I'm going to say certain things about these technologies, they change literally all the time, and in addition to that, people are just adding garbage features to them all the time. So I might say that you know you tend to do one certain type of replication with them, but the truth of the matter is probably all different types are supported because they're open source, and some bozo at some point in time was like, I want to do leaderless replication with MySQL. Don't know why you would, but they probably did it. So let's go ahead and get into things, talk about this, and get started. So SQL databases, we went over these in the last video, and we know that they're good for relational data normalized data, where you basically want to have one reference to your piece of data and have it stay consistent throughout all of your data. You don't want to denormalize your data where you'd have to potentially have multiple copies of a given write, and then that would be problematic in terms of you know having to write to your data multiple times. You might even need distributed transactions if you want to guarantee correctness of all of your data. So just as an example of that, we've got our people table, we've got our attractions table. As you can see, I'm primary ID number one, Jordan, and then we have three lovely ladies over here who are all attracted to me, checks out pretty consistent with real life. The question is though, and we started to talk about this last video, obviously we want to be using a relational database table when we have relational data that should be normalized. But are there ever cases where we should do it even when we don't care about having relational data? And my answer to that is yes, albeit only sometimes. So let's talk about why we would based on the architecture of both MySQL and Postgres and just other relational databases in general. So generally speaking, because SQL databases are a little bit older than NoSQL ones, they were kind of the predominant type of database from like the 1980s onwards, they tend to use slightly older architectures and I guess that has certain performance uh, kind of characteristics, at least in theory. In practice, there are all sorts of random optimizations and edge cases that all of these different types of databases have implemented. And so, you know, to actually go and be like, oh, you know, this thing is going to have this many transactions per second because it uses a B tree or an LSM tree, I won't do that. I can't do that. I would be a sham if I tried to do that. But in an interview, you can get away with saying stuff like this because it shows that you understand the concepts. So let's go ahead and do that. So what are some common features of most SQL databases? Well, for one, they tend to be B-tree based indexes. So as a quick reminder for everyone, a B-tree based index is pictured here on the right, and it's where you actually have a tree on disk for both your reads and your writes that you are basically directly writing to and from. In contrast to an LSM tree, an SS table based index, where we have a basically memory based tree plus a bunch of different tables on disk, Reads, in theory, should be a little bit faster on the B tree because we just jump right to our thing as opposed to an LSM tree based table where first we check here and then we check here and then we check here and then we check here. So again, could be better for reads, could be worse for writes. In practice, again, tons of software optimizations that can be done and you would really just have to try them out for your own setup and figure out what is best based on benchmarking. Number two. Single leader replication. Now, like I mentioned, it is the case that you can do any sort of replication with any of these databases. It just tends to be the case that I think most people using relational databases are using single leader replication just because, I don't know, that's kind of the traditional way of doing it. I feel like that's more of like the mantra of the relational database system. Feel free to call me out on this, but uh, no one ever does. So here we are, I'm gonna say it anyway. Single leader replication, multi-leader replication, this guy can have write conflicts, which we can deal with using things like version vectors or CRDTs, but at the end of the day, that doesn't necessarily get rid of the conflicts. It just gives us a way of ensuring that all of our databases agree on the result. It doesn't necessarily make the result correct, whereas single leader replication, we've got basically one bottleneck, a single database that all the writes have to go through, and thus we can achieve an ordering on our writes. Finally, we have configurable isolation levels. 
Now, a lot of NoSQL databases, and we'll touch upon this in the next few videos, don't necessarily give you the ability to have fully ACID compliant transactions. They're not necessarily completely isolated, and we can't necessarily establish an ordering over all of them as if they were running on one thread. On the other hand, for these relational databases, you do at least have the option to do that. However, it does come at a performance cost, obviously, because it involves either locking or serializable snapshot isolation, both of which we will talk about right now. So this is kind of the main difference that I've decided to pick out between MySQL and Postgres, which is that, yeah, obviously you can go look at the feature sets of all of them, then you'll see that Postgres has like a few more supported index types, but I'm really trying to think of like the core functionality of the two systems here. And, you know, this was kind of the main one that I picked out. Their indexes are generally similar. MySQL uses InnoDB. I don't think Postgres does. But, uh, yeah, I picked this out. Sorry, you're going to have to listen to me here. So for MySQL, we use two-phase locking. And two-phase locking is where basically every single row has locks. In order to read a row in a transaction that's read-only, you can grab the lock in a shared mode. But in order to write, you have to get it in an exclusive mode. And so that makes reads a little bit more optimized than writes. That being said, you still do have to grab a lot of locks at the end of the day. And with all of those locks, we can have transactions that grab the same set of locks, thus causing deadlocks, which we would have to get rid of and hurt our performance even more. On the other hand, Postgres uses serializable snapshot isolation which is a bit newer of a technology. I should also mention that I think MySQL is, is starting to get into this as well, but like, again, you know, these feature sets change all the time. If you're watching this video in a year from now, who knows how true any of this will be. So that's why I make these sweeping generalizations, which could be wrong, but either way, it serves as a good case study for our point. So Postgres uses SSI, which uh, I have a dedicated video on this if you need more information on it, but the overall summary is that transactions will read from a data snapshot and, of course, if a transaction reads a value from a given snapshot that, by the time it's trying to commit, has since been modified by a second transaction, we need to roll back the original. And so there are going to be some transactions get, that get rolled back, but this is ultimately a form of OCC, which is optimistic concurrency control, because we're not locking, assuming that everything can go wrong. We're acting as if nothing can go wrong, and then when it does, we roll back. Okay, so what are the conclusions of using SQL databases? Well, I did clickbait you guys in the sense that, you know, mainly I kind of wanted to just talk about SQL databases and I figured MySQL versus Postgres would be a better title. But the point is, in addition to needing normalized data, which is a really good use case for when you want a SQL database, another good use case is when you just need data that has to be correct. If you need ACID compliant transactions, because otherwise you could have conflicting rights and race conditions, then you basically need to use a SQL database. Most of the NoSQL ones don't really support these isolation levels. Again, I kind of say that, take that with a grain of salt because they can all eventually implement them. Who knows what's gonna happen? That being said, when you do have to choose between those two SQL databases, which are mainly MySQL and Postgres, I feel like those are the two most popular open source ones, even though Postgres does use SSI, if there are potentially a lot of kind of conflicting transactions to be had, then that means you're going to be doing a lot of rollbacks, which ultimately might be more costly than just locking pessimistically. So that is something to keep in mind. You have to think about your actual data use case. If you're like building a counter and that's the only thing your database is doing, and so every single thing is like a read, modify, update cycle where those two writes are overlapping with one another, then maybe you'd actually just be better off with locking than rolling back. 90% of your rights. So in that case, pessimistic locking could actually be better. But hopefully this makes sense, guys. Generally, yeah, if you care about data correctness, you probably want single leader replication. You probably want ACID transactions. And then at that point, a SQL database mostly makes sense. The B tree versus LSM tree thing is a little bit different. I guess that's more of like whether you care about prioritizing reads versus writes, but ultimately it is still something to think about too. Anyways, guys, have a great rest of the weekend. I will see you in the next one and looking forward to it.